this Texas railroad uh, worker who applies for a job with the railroad. So he has this job interview with the railroad boss and the, uh, the employer says, young man, uh, imagine that you're working on the railroad and you see a high-speed train coming from the left. And then you turn around and you look the other way and you see a high-speed train also coming from the right. What would you do at that moment? And the young man says, uh, Sir, I would go and get my brother. Why, says the, the employer, why would you want to get your brother? Well, says the young man, he has never seen a train wreck before. <laughs> well, obviously, obviously, uh, that's not a sufficient answer to the kinds of problems we had in the 1960s, and it's surely not the kind of answer we need for the problems of the 21st century. Our mutual perception problems are really mutual. They are not one-sided. On the U.S. side, there is criticism of German policy, European policy, and quite a bit of negative attitude about my country. I, I don't just mean things like uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's remark about, you know, an older, less relevant Europe. Uh, I also have in mind uh, newspaper articles that, that paint a picture of Germany as the sick man of Europe, unwilling to invest in defense, having a sclerotic welfare society, living beyond its means, losing its competitive edge, um, and being incapable of reform. And you know, uh, uh, I'm sure, how Europeans have tended to exaggerate what they, what they see as, as uh, uh, American military adventurism. Uh, American politicians, the, the, the president, the administration, are being uh, uh, described as, a, as, a, as, an, as an incredible caricature. So I think this, these are dangerously distorted attitudes on both sides. In all fairness, I want to tell you that I think the worst is behind us. Uh, I think we have move beyond the stage of mutual recrimination and both sides have uh, been trying to be uh, more reasonable uh, in their relationship to one another. I can certainly say that of the relationship between Chancellor Schroeder on the one hand and President Bush on the other hand. We've had a number of meetings between the two leaders this earlier this year which have been uh, which have led to good results and a, the re-establishment of a good working relationship. Um, but there is, I think, um, behind all of this, the question, uh, is the old logic of the post uh, World War II European-American relationship gone? Can we re-establish uh, a kind of relationship as we had it in the maybe 1960s, 70s, 80s? Or is it over? And I would like to talk to you for just a few minutes about uh, the options that, that are before us and where I believe we ought to move. The essence of the case of those who hold that the recent U.S.-German unpleasantness over Iraq is not merely a temporary estrangement, but evidence of a long-term structural divergence is as follows. The argument is very simple. The Atlantic Alliance has declined in importance, and the same applies to a close U.S.-German partnership because our strategic priorities have moved 
uh, into different directions. Germany is seen as less dependent on the U.S., bound uh, to be a less reliable U.S. partner. The enlarged European Union is seen as a work in process with weak and uncoordinated defense capabilities. Uh, given Germany's weight uh, in the Union, this limits the Federal Republic's freedom of action and leads to a preference to pursue German influence on wider non-European issues through international institutions while avoiding confrontation in favor of negotiation and compromise. In contrast, it is said U.S. priorities are overwhelmingly global and have shifted from a focus across the Atlantic to remaking the Middle East and to bilateral relations with those countries that matter, uh, that matter today more than maybe they did in earlier times. Germany is seen as a regional power, the United States as a distinctly, the only distinctly global one. As the world's only superpower, America has less interest than Germany to strengthen the power of the United Nations or other multilateral institutions, instead preferring to maintain freedom of action, to use its overwhelming military power, and to focus on traditional diplomacy with key sovereign states, states such, such as Russia, Japan, and rising new powers like China and India. This, in brief, is the core argument underlying what Henry Kissinger has called the structural estrangement of America from Europe. There are variants and extensions of this idea. Some Europeans see in U.S. policies not only hegemonic, but even more sinister motives. The doctrine of preemption and prevention is for some a clear manifestation of American imperialism. Some go even further and suspect the U.S. of having abandoned its long-standing support for European unification and of being engaged in a policy of benign neglect, if not a deliberate effort to undermine the building of a stronger and more coherent EU. So I want to uh, try to give you my assessment of whether those who doubt our ability to, uh, to have a reasonable transatlantic relationship are right, uh, or whether, and I believe that, uh, there is uh, uh, reason to believe that we can do a better job. It is true, no doubt, that our respective strategic priorities have shifted. Recent world developments have fundamentally altered the situation on both sides of the Atlantic. It is true that as new issues have arisen, the enlargement of the EU, world terrorism, new trouble spots in the Middle East, our foreign policy priorities have shifted as well. It is equally true that the United States, as the world's only remaining superpower, uh, is playing a vastly different role than European powers. In absolute numbers, the half trillion dollar annual military budget of your country practically equals that of the entire rest of the world combined. It is three times that of all other NATO countries and eight times that of Russia and China. Maybe even more important than such statistics are differences in, in, in the way we look at our present situation. I was uh, asked to give a keynote speech a few weeks ago at a meeting between American members of Congress and their German counterparts. And they expected me to, you know, to come up and speak to them for 30 minutes or so, and I decided not to do that. I opened this meeting by saying, I want to do a little polling exercise here. I'm going to ask you the question, do you believe that you are right now 
at war